On behalf of everyone here at Practicing Place, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to our midterm conference here, there, somewhere in between Practicing Place and Configuring. Uh, so I hope that you're all somewhat situated here in Eichstätt, um, whether situated by Michael's walking tour, immersed in Remé's installation, or perhaps introduced in the last step of the journey from the wilderness of Eichstätt Bahnhof <laughs> on what uh, my colleague Ulla and I affectionately call the wee train, or indeed by the need to turn off your <laughs> internet <laughs> for a live stream. <laughs> So the Graduate School Practicing Place Social Cultural Practices and Epistemic Configurations, we officially began in April 2021. So it's a time when the everyday work, care, eat, pray, life was largely confined to home and of course displayed on Zoom. Uh, and now we're at something of an in-between. We're negotiating where to wear masks, what rules apply, when and where, and it's a year and a half since we began. We are an interdisciplinary school, and one could also describe uh, the productive tensions and translations as something of an in-between, a placing across the borders of discipline knowledge production. And the projects within our group uh, take us across urban and island imaginaries to places of social justice struggle, working class formations, and contested claims to sustainability, from video gaming epistemes to game hunting. But for the midterm conference, we sought to discuss the dynamics of placing. The act of constitution and everyday practices of place, as well as the agentic correlation of place upon those within or indeed without. But placing is not a strictly top-down affair. As Doreen Massey taught us, place is a process, not a singular identity, but a struggle. Placing is effective, cognitive, experienced, material, at once potentially an exclusionary container and a rupture. And as our opening keynote speaker, Tim Creswell noted, in any given place, we encounter a combination of materiality, meaning and practice. And this bears out across the contributions for the next two days. Uh, the programme is composed of <clears throat> a group of scholars from diverse disciplines and locations, and alongside our geographical and literary keynotes, uh, the chosen panellists were grouped thematically by practice, sensing, contesting, imagining, producing, and constructing. So before our hotly anticipated opening keynote in a few moments, I just wanted to take a short detour, sort of wander across the panel lines to note the wealth of sites of connection that bind a community of research in practicing place. So both Emma Patchett and Stephanie Walbrown speak of the violent claims in public space across the figures of the vagabond and citizen, which we'll hear about in a few moments. But we also see the disruptive potentials of placing, the possibilities and limits of radical remaking across the artistic practices that are examined by Emen el and Hannah Sophia Hull, the reading of Black Hope through an abolitionist geographical lens by Anthony Obst, and the green utopic ideals of 70s urban planners in Northern California. This will be explored by Anthony Rainsford. The conference touches upon the body from the subterranean sensorial mapping of the London Underground charted by Craig Melhoff to Rosa Phillips examination of gendered and indigenous resistance in Mexico while the sonic thinking proposed by Rémy Bocquillon and the autoethnographic narrative method of Ian Grosch open methodological possibilities. From the comedy stage in Nellis Sawalish's contribution to Sheila Brannigan's work on the photographic exposure of everyday out of places in sweatshops and laundromats, to what Aileen Gungor um, terms as the black urban imaginary screened in the series Atlanta, places Place is both mediated and mediating. The strategies of negotiating liminal identities are foregrounded in Shurik Ibrahim's literary analysis of what they term circular hybridity, and the filmic productions that Oyo's Kair explores as the geopolitics of diasporic displacement. The role of the everyday is also underscored by work um, that expands the base of expertise uh, on place to those who live and exist therein. 
So the work uh, of Judith Keller working with testimonials on the DC housing crisis, and Neha, Neha Mina's ethnography in Pakistani Hindu settlements in Rajasthan underscore the importance of these expertise. Our second keynote uh, by Antia Clay uh, takes us to the disruptions and narrations of grief, and that's where I want to sort of wrap up this welcome, uh, a natural end, of course. <laughs> but as a person from the UK who is an immigrant elsewhere, the news at home is often pretty disruptive to my mood, or like my sanity, I guess. Um, but as we were preparing the conference, the death of the Queen in September and the alliterative capitalized phenomena of the Q came up in conversation as a sort of placing of British identities. The practice of queuing itself is often regarded as quintessentially British in the keep calm fashion. And people waited at the longest for over 24 hours in this collective wait to pay respects. The Queen's death prompted ongoing conversations on empire, commonwealth, patriotism, and the future of the monarchy. <clears throat> But critique was also shut, time, shut down at times with lethal, uh, legal force, with the refrain that this was not the time nor the place. But as scholars in the practices of place, we unpick these power relations in placing to explore the silences, the limits, and the possibilities of otherwise. So the program assembled and the discussions that we're going to have over the next two days, I'm sure, speak to the salience of unsettling the taken for granted in unpacking the contestations and placing, a route to examine the existential and the everyday. Recognizing the multiplicity of meanings, materialities and practices that contradict and resist a simple, a simple singular, pure place. So I'll leave you with a quote from uh, Bell Hooks, whose work traced the many stratifications and orderings enacted in and through place while they remain committed to sustained practices of mutuality and solidarity, Hooks urges us towards the placings necessary to avoid becoming trapped in place. What matters is that should difference enter the world, the world of beloved community, it can find a place of welcome, a place to belong. Thank you and uh, welcome once again. And I'll now hand you over to Hans Martin, who will get us started with the programme. And on behalf of everyone here, we're really looking forward to getting everything underway. Yeah, dear Sarah, thank you. Thank you very much. And dear colleagues, dear friends, dear place community, good morning also from, from this end. I'm allowed to chair the first session of our conference, the keynote from Professor Cresswell, University of Edinburgh. In a context that deals with the notion of place, the dynamics of place, there is actually no need to introduce Professor Tim Cresswell, who is author of Place, an introduction. Nevertheless, I would like to take a few moments for some introductory words. Tim Cresswell holds the Ogilvy Chair at the University of Edinburgh, a named chair which is, at least in our field, human geography, an absolute exception, so this is already a distinct sign of excellence. He's, by training, a cultural geographer with a PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and his work has a clear focus on the role of place and space and mobility in social and cultural life. He also holds a PhD from Royal Holloway in creative writing, so Tim Cresswell is also a widely published poet. Among the recent academic books is Maxwell Street, Writing and Thinking Place, published in 2019 by the University of Chicago Press. And a maybe noteworthy issue at this point might be that quite exactly nine years ago, in December 2013, when you have been holding a chair in, in, in Boston, I think, Eastern, University in Spatial Humanities, you presented and discussed some early excerpts and thoughts here at Eichstätt in a seminar on the power of place we organized in a research training group called the philosophy of place. And this was an important starting point for our new project, the now ongoing project, the Practicing Place Project. 
So thanks for mentioning our discussion those days in your book. And the book turned out good. It's <laughs> <laughs> very good, well cited. It was a highly uh, inspiration for our group here. Uh, we discussed this in our class. Put differently, there appears to be a fruitful connection between our work and our places. And it will be interesting to see and to learn what will be the next output yeah, from this event, from the experiment you're going to present, you're going to do with us today on roots and on rooting. So I, from my side, as a final comment, can state already now that I would be happy to further develop this thin establishment, this route between Edinburgh and Eichstätt, and there might be one day uh, in between a hybrid like a Eichborough or <laughs> Edinstadt. And dear Tim, thank you very much for being here again. The floor is yours. Well, first of all, I want to really thank Hans Martin and Ulla in particular for the organization and the invitation. And um, uh, thank you very much. And, and, it, what an, and I've looked over the papers and such an exciting array of things I'm looking forward to hearing about over the next few days. Um, there's, so there's two, two explanations I think I need to give. One is about what, what's going to happen in its form. So I'm going to um, show you a video. And I know that you might be thinking, haven't we had enough of that? Um, but a couple of things happened during during lockdown um, for me one was one was of course having to teach uh, remotely and that meant making videos and there are various ways that can be done uh, one way in Edinburgh anyway one way is you can simply walk into the room where you would have uh, given the lecture and it will record it for you and you can record to an empty room as though there were people in it and record it another way is you can sit in front of your computer and do a recording um, uh, you know, in your room, wherever. You could also do that live on Zoom, of course. Um, but I decided, well, given that I had to do this, I was going to make it as fun as I could, um, both for me and for the students. And so I took a course uh, in video making for social scientists that was, of course, online. Um, but it was, it was, I learned how to make videos with my, with my iPhone. And then I also did an editing course with Premiere Pro to learn how to make videos that would be more interesting than the normal way in which that was done. So that was one thing. Another thing that I did was I watched a lot of things on television during COVID um, and on YouTube. And um, one of the things that I watched was a series of lectures, the, the, the Norton series of poetry lectures that Harvard has every year. And they'd invited the performance artist, Laurie Anderson, to give the, the Harvard, the Norton Poetry Lectures. And um, she obviously presented them as videos. And you can find them on YouTube, there's six of them. Um, and they are, because she's an, a, a crazily brilliant uh, performance artist, I don't know how many of you know her work. Um, uh, and we're technologically adept at using video and sound and all kinds of things. And I did watch them and I was just mesmerized and awestruck and thought I just want to be Laurie Anderson, really. In fact, if I could be a mixture of Laurie Anderson and John Berger or some, somewhere like somewhere around there, I would probably, that's probably what I'd want to be. And, um, and I don't have all, the, all of her technology in my, my house, unfortunately, and neither do I have, you know, 30 years of experience using it. But um, I thought, well, Maybe this is also an opportunity to uh, break open the prison house of PowerPoint. Right? One, one, I have a particular PowerPoint in, inside of itself has a, a structure which leads you into doing things in certain ways. It usually starts with bullet points and goes from there. And it can be used really well. And I don't want to offend anyone that's using PowerPoint over the next day or two. And I use it all the time when I'm teaching, a lot of the time when I'm teaching. But I thought, well, why does a presentation, a lecture have to be this? me standing here like this, uh, telling you some stuff with um, some static images and PowerPoints and bullet points and things behind me when I could do something more like Laurie Anderson. And so um, when this opportunity came up, I had this, this and another, another uh, conference. With, I needed something new. I wanted to do something I hadn't done before. Um, and I thought, I'll, I'll do it this way. The second piece of explanation is much more uh, uh, academic, intellectual, if you like. And that is that. Um, 
Uh, I'm working on a book following up from the book On the Move in 2006 and following up also from the 2010 paper uh, Towards a Politics of Mobility. And in, in that paper, uh, for those of you who know it, um, you'll can turn off for a few minutes, but there's um, a number of different ways into a politics of mobility that I explore aspects of mobility, including things like speed and rhythm and... Um, and uh, direction and, and routes is one of them. And so the book that I'm working on called um, The Citizen and the Vagabond, The Politics of Mobility, um, uses the figures of the citizen and vagabond as starting points for thinking about the way in which mobility is differentially distributed and is, in, is both a reflection of and an instrument in the production of power. And uh, after an introduction about citizens and vagabonds, quite a long uh, set of thoughts about what those figures mean. Uh, the rest of the book could be constructed along those, those aspects from the paper. So the chapters are called things like on rhythm, um, on speed, which is, maybe I should change that. <laughs> maybe on velocity, I'll call it that. Um, uh, and one of, the, one of them was on routes, and I hadn't really, I, I've done, been working on some of these for a while, and I hadn't worked on routes, so I thought this is an opportunity to start thinking that. And, and the way that these, uh, chapters are constructed are really kind of provocations. They're kind of critical, critical phenomenologies, I guess. They're thinking about what it is about these, these sort of raw aspects of the ways that we move that allow us into ways of thinking about power and mobility. And, and they're not supposed to be like watertight theories or anything like that. They're just um, different provocations, like, like essays, essays that provoke different ways of thinking about mobility. And of course, they're interrelated. There's no separation of rhythm and roots and velocity in real life. They're all connected. But, but it, each one is a, is a way in to talking about some of the same things. So, so what this video is, it is a, a first go at writing my roots chapter, but at the same time thinking about making the video. And what my intent is, is to have a video for each chapter of the book. Um, which will be a shorter version of the chapter and done in a different way that we'll, I'll have on a Vimeo channel or something like that that people can look at when they, um, when they read the book or um, even if they don't read the book. So what I'm going to do is show you this video, uh, which is about uh, 35 minutes or so, and then I'm answer some questions and think about both maybe just both the, the strategy of doing that and the content of it, probably more importantly. So hopefully this will all work and I'm going to go and sit down and watch myself, which is also a weird, <laughs> a weird thing to do, to be in the audience at the same time as you're the presenter. But anyway, here we go. Oh, there it is. Here we go. Midway upon the journey of our life, I found myself within a forest dark, for the straightforward pathway had been lost. Mobilities do not happen randomly across an isotropic plane. This was the imaginary world of certain kinds of spatial science, a flat, smooth surface where the only source of friction was distance. It was this kind of imaginary flat world that resulted in all kinds of spatial models from the 1820s onwards. Walter Cristala's central place theory of 1933, for instance, imagined a flat and limitless surface where mobility was equally easy in all directions and the costs of mobility were directly proportional to distance. On this world, he produced his spatial patterns of perfect nested hexagons. A century earlier, similar imaginaries formed the basis for von Schoenen's land use model of 1826, where concentric rings of different agricultural products form around a central place depending on the relative cost of the transport of products to the central market. The mobilities in these models are mobilities without roots. Etymologically, the word root has roots in Old English root, meaning road or way or path, which is itself based on the Latin rupta, the feminine past participle of rumpere, to break. Rupta was used to describe a road opened by force, a breaking through a forest, for instance, and it's linked to the word rupture. Root as a noun means several different things. Perhaps most obviously, it means the precise path through space between two points, a line marked by direction and distance, a route has a shape. 
A map of routes is not a map of a territory, but the two are related. A map of routes forms a network that activates the territory. A map of routes is a map of the space over which rule can be enforced. The network of Roman roads ends at the edge of empire. A network of railways in India during the British Empire was a map of colonial power conceived by the East India Company Governor-General Lord Harding, who argued that the planned railways would be beneficial to the commerce, government and military control of the country. The subsequent network of routes was primarily designed to transport resources such as iron, coal and cotton to ports from where they could be extracted back to Britain. The network is an image of colonial rule. The network of routes pictured in a British Airways in-flight magazine is a ghostly image of empire. Similar maps in the magazines of other airlines reflect their geopolitical ambition and reach. There are two different kinds of routes as nouns. One kind of route is simply a designation for links between points that might be represented by lines on maps. The other is a specific material assemblage, a structure such as Route 66. Either way, a route typically has a beginning and an end, as well as a passage through space. It can be both a representation of mobility and an infrastructure that enables mobility. Route is also a verb. Routing can refer to the simple process of connecting two points. To route something is to direct something along a particular course or towards a particular point. The verb suggests an act of channeling, of slotting a person or thing into an established way, the correct way. It suggests a certain kind of power and authority. Routes connect places. They are the line that links A to B. When we say that central place theory was based on mobilities without routes, what we really mean is that all routes are imagined to be straight. The straight line might be the imagined preferred route of the planner and technocrat, but it is an illusion. Even birds, it turns out, do not fly as the crow flies. The man of reason, Locke Abusier tells us, walks in a straight line because he has a goal and knows where he is going. He has made up his mind to reach some particular place and goes straight to it. Straight lines link to numerical values, certainty, authority, a sense of direction. They've been diagnosed by the anthropologist Tim Ingold. Ingold described the straight line as a virtual icon of modernity, an index of the triumph of the rational, purposeful design over the vicissitudes of the natural world. Straightness, he writes, has been associated with mind as against matter, with rational thought as against sensory perception, with intellect as against intuition, with science as against traditional knowledge, with male as against female, with civilization as against primitiveness, and, on the most general level, with culture as against nature. Despite their ubiquity in modern life, however, most routes outside of the imaginations of planners are not straight lines. Routes take many forms, but despite their centrality, remain under-theorised. One place where routes are particularly important is the seemingly smooth space of the seas of the oceans. The history of oceanic control is different, of course, from the history of territoriality, largely because oceans are not land, not terra. Phil Steinberg and others have related histories of the ocean as a space of mobility outside of territory that through their mobilities helped to constitute the apparently bounded control of land. The development of ideas of wet ontologies by Steinberg and Kimberly Peters takes this further, noting that ontologies have depth as well as expanse. This becomes particularly important for thinking of routes at sea focusing on the multitude of routes through and across the English Channel and the ways they are connected in reference to what lies below the sea as well as on its surface. Peters contends that more attention must be paid to routing. Routes, she insists, are as fundamental to globalisation as the material technologies of ships and their cargo. It is safe routes, recommended and governed corridors, which invisibly keep ships and their cargo moving. Maritime motorways or traffic separation schemes are a particular type of safe route that stewards shipping in the narrowest and shallowest of oceanic bottlenecks worldwide. 
Peters notes how explicit discussion of roots and rooting are oddly absent from discussions of the wet ontologies of the seas. Using the tech terminology of Deleuze and Guattari, the sea is envisioned as a smooth space of logistics, which ignores the striations that occur through the production and policing of roots. Acknowledging roots, Peters writes, is essential to make sense of our global world of connection, contributing to and theoretically deepening debates beyond the visual and material, beyond the ship and its load. Roots and rooting are fundamental to our understanding of trade, commerce and far more. So what happens if we take Peter's provocations further, at sea for sure, but also back on dry land? What happens if we begin to construct a critical account of roots as a counterpoint to those other lines on maps, borders? Recent work on borders has asked us to think about acts of bordering, unbordering and rebordering, as well as the more obvious territorial borders of the political world map. Similar work can be done with roots and rooting. Roots and rooting are every bit as fundamental to the ordering of the world as borders and bordering are. Connection is every bit as important as separation. What would a critical account of roots and rooting look like? I love its muddiness. Rubbed bald, it's as if we've worn a line into the land, like rabbits in the dunes at Inislas, dizzy with free will. One place we might logically look for an account of roots is Jim Clifford's books, Roots. This book is foundational in challenging the pervasive organic association between identity and fixity, belonging in place. He challenged the authority and authenticity of roots with the role of travel and connection in the constitution of culture. His central argument was that fixity did not come before travel, rather forms of fixity could be seen as outcomes of the processes of travel and translation. The reverse, if you like, of the logic of migration that sees it as an outcome of the qualities of places that are left and the qualities of places that are arrived at. Despite the title, however, this book is not really about roots. Roots, for the most part, act as a stand-in for travel, mobility and connectivity. The focus is on points of contact, such as museums and airport lounges. I get the sense that the only reason the book is called Roots is because it's a homophone for the word roots, which appears to have an opposite meaning. Indeed, the fact that roots and roots are homophones and opposites has provided the basis for the emerging poetics of the new mobilities paradigm. In Clifford's book, however, roots, as in most sedentarist work, are left untheorised, leaving conceptual work that needs to be done. A root can also signify a material infrastructure with a particular history, an assemblage of materials that make it possible to take that route. We can think of Route 66 or the Silk Road, we can think of Pete Merriman's M1 motorway, even Peter's watery routes of the English Channel or the aerial routes that Wei Chang Lin and Lucy Budd write of, have, which all have their infrastructures of codes and regulations, buildings and communication networks. These infrastructures enable the routes to act as channels, vectors and conduits across the three dimensions of air and water. Let's linger for a moment on the notion of path dependency. This is a concept in social science that describes the continuing presence of the past in the present. It insists on the relative intransience of certain aspects of our world that once in place are hard to get rid of. For the most part, the word path is metaphorical. It is used to refer to institutions or forms of ingrained behaviour that ensure that the past is present in the present. But like all metaphors, the source domain for this particular set of meanings is instructive. A path is a route taken, a course traced by a meteor across the sky, or an actual piece of infrastructure that allows us to make our way, such as a footpath. If we think of mobility infrastructures as paths, then we can see that paths too have path dependencies. The sheep heft a path into the hills, sheep drovers follow sheep paths and lick them up as they take sheep to market. Drover trails become tracks which become roads for horses, carts and eventually cars. Roads become easily accessible spaces for layering of other infrastructures such as telephone wires, gas pipes and electricity cables, fibre optic broadband routes. The land along the railroad lines of the Southern Pacific Railroad were used to lay fibre optic cable. The US telephone company Sprint gets its name from the long since defunct railroad company, 
It stands for Southern Pacific Railroad Internal Network Communica Telecommunications. Roots as material infrastructure project particular arrangements of power into the future. In Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari's account of nomadology, they point out that it is not simply a case of free mobile nomads challenging the royal science of fixed division and classification. Mobility itself is channeled into acceptable conduits. Smooth space is a field without conduits or channels. Producing order and predictability is not simply a matter of fixing in space, but of channeling motion of producing correct mobilities through the designation of routes. One of the fundamental tasks of the state, they write, is to striate the space over which it reigns, or to utilise smooth spaces as a means of communication in the service of striated space. If it can help it, the state does not dissociate itself from the process of capture of flows of all kinds, populations, commodities, money or capital, etc. There is still a need for fixed paths in well-defined directions which restrict speed, regulate circulation, relativise movement and measure in detail the relative movements of subjects and objects. The state striates space by assigning channels and conduits. Roots are thus mechanisms of power through their capacity to distribute mobilities. The state, Deleuze and Guattari write, seeks to constrain movement to go from one place to another and space itself to be striated and measured, which means the fluid depends on the solid, the flows proceed by parallel, lamina, layers. Roland Barthes wrote that before anything else, the first thing the power imposes is rhythm. Perhaps the second thing the power imposes are roots, the fixed paths in well-defined directions that Deleuze and Guattari write of. More concretely, Stephen Graham and Simon Marvin have developed the notion of a tunnelling effect in the contemporary urban landscape. They show how the routing of infrastructural elements ranging from roads to high-speed computer links warps the time and space of cities. Valued areas of the metropolis are targeted so that they are drawn into intense interaction with each other, while other areas are effectively disconnected from these routes. Examples include the highways that pass through the landscape but only let you get off at major hubs, or think of high-speed train lines that pass from airport to city centre while bypassing the inner city in between. These tunnels facilitate speed for some while ensuring the slowness of those who are bypassed. Examples include the highways that pass through the landscape but only let you get off at major hubs, or think of high-speed train lines that pass from airport to city centre while bypassing the inner city in between. These tunnels facilitate speed for some while ensuring the slowness of those who are bypassed. Routes provide connectivity that in turn transforms topographical space into topological and indeed dramological space. Graham and Marvin quote Ofner, space-time no longer corresponds to Euclidean space. Distance is no longer the relevant variable in assessing accessibility. Connectivity, being in relation to, is added to or even imposed upon contiguity, being next to. This is what roots do to the flat world dreams of von Tunen and Kristalla. They warp the friction of distance into new folds of space-time. They produce new maps of connectivity that reflect the interests of those doing the connecting. Routes can bring locations into relation through the foregoing of connections, but they can also disconnect, leading to the splintering of cities that Graham and Marvin write about. What do routes and routing do? Most obviously, perhaps, they connect two or more places. Every point along a route is seemingly connected to every other. Routes facilitate movement. They're enabling infrastructures, assemblages designed to facilitate relatively smooth travel along them. Routes produce spaces that surround them. Routes that take the form of fixed infrastructure, roads and railways for instance, do not simply link spaces, they produce them, as Eric Swingadu has observed. A railway, a motorway or a communication line, for example, all liberate actions from place and reduce the friction associated with distance and other space-time barriers. However, such transportation and communication organisation can only liberate activities from their embeddedness in space by producing new configurations, by harnessing the social process in a new geography of places and connecting flows. 
Routes, in other words, remake geographies. Most obviously, the places that a route connects become relationally tied to each other in potentially productive ways. We know, for instance, that the material geographies of places along the new Elizabeth Line in London are transformed by the access it provides to other places along the line, particularly the City of London. People who work in the city can now easily live in Acton and get to work in half an hour. Needless to say, house prices have been transformed immediately. Fancy new train stations being hubs or spaces with speculative property development. The spaces along a route might also be transformed. When the new Denver International Airport was built 10 miles out of the city on a flat and tornado ridden plain, it had to be connected with a new route, the Peña Boulevard, which itself opened up new spatial possibilities, the Denver Connection for instance. The Denver Connection is a 400 acre master plan development, including 292 acres of improved land within the Green Valley Ranch neighborhood of Denver, Colorado, the fastest developing region in the Northeast Denver submarket. The site is located at the intersection of Pena Boulevard and Green Valley Ranch Boulevard. Pena Boulevard is a major highway connecting Denver International Airport, just 10 miles from Denver Connection, to the I-70. There's a Denver TRD light rail stop, 40th Street and Airport Boulevard, just a five minute walk from the site, which provides commuter rail service directly to both Denver International Airport and downtown Denver. NRC operates 4.2 acres of retail property with a development including Chase Bank, Duncan, H2 Wow Car Wash, 7-Eleven and McDonald's. Or perhaps more thrillingly, a new smart city called Peña Station. Something extraordinary happens when you combine an integrated and connected community smart grid clean energy and enhanced mobility. Welcome to Peña Station. Next, an entirely new kind of community and a global showcase for integrating innovation into the fabric of cities, setting a new standard for smart, sustainable, connected living. Visit here, live here, work here, evolve here. That's the type of transit oriented community we're building here at Peña Station. These are spaces that explicitly sell the new possibilities of connectivity enabled by a new infrastructure of routes. The space beside the road becomes a new space of possibility. Routes don't simply connect places that already exist. Spaces and places are made through acts of routing. I want to return to the root meanings of root and its connections etymologically to rupture. Just as a root can play a role in the production of space, so it can destroy already existing places. The infrastructures of roots organise systems of spatial power. Roots do this through the brute materiality of their presence, the specific concrete forms they take. Through the meanings we ascribe to roots as infrastructures that organise meanings, and through the ways they are practised. The Dan Ryan Expressway on the south side of Chicago was opened in 1961. It was a product of the National Interstate and Defense Highway Act of 1956, the biggest public works project in the history of the United States. The Dan Ryan Expressway was just one part of 41,000 miles of interstate highway authorized for construction across the nation. The roads were built in order to ensure the ease of interstate commerce and to increase the mobility opportunities of American citizens and also to ensure logistical smoothness in the case of attack by a foreign power. The interstates did far more than this, however. In addition to producing a new diagram of American connectedness, ensuring the future development of the United States would be largely automobile based, they cut through neighborhoods, destroyed housing and produced new barriers to mobility, cutting off some parts of cities from others. Routes as rupture. The Dan Ryan Expressway was originally planned to cut through Bridgeport, the neighbourhood of Mayor Daly, a neighbourhood which, as you might expect, was relatively affluent and white. When the final plans emerged, it had been adjusted to follow Wentworth Avenue South. Wentworth Avenue was a historical dividing line between majority black and majority white parts of the city. A dividing line historically policed by all manner of racial violence enforced by white gangs disguised as athletics clubs. A line that Langston Hughes was beaten up for crossing. Wentworth Avenue was replaced by 14 lanes of traffic. The chosen route 
through the majority black Bronzeville also meant that far more black homes than white homes had to be demolished, despite only making up 23% of the city's population, 64% of those displaced by construction were black. When it was finished, the route of the Dan Ryan Expressway facilitated relatively speedy north-south travel by car, but effectively cut off older east-west routes linking black and white neighbourhoods. And it was not just in urban environments that routes create rupture. One of the structural reasons for increased threats from viruses such as SARS-CoV-2 is the rupture caused by roads being built into relatively undisturbed forests in the name of development. Aerial shots of Amazonia show how 95% of all forest destruction and the preponderance of major forest fires occurs within five kilometres of roads. The rupture of routes can also bring with it unexpected mobilities and unwanted connections. And I'm thinking now of desire lines. These are the marks made on the earth as humans and other animals create their own routes, following their desires rather than the expectations of planners. There's tracks across the park, to the gap in the fence, through the carefully planted hedge. I'm grinning. They're everywhere. On floors of palaces, the hotel atrium, foyers of hospitals and headquarters, transecting terminals, linking arrivals with departures. In Finland, planners rise before dawn to map the footprints in snow's blank geography. Our routes through the city are subject to extraordinary levels of surveillance. The poet and artist Martin Ingalls became intrigued by the proliferation of security cameras in his home city of Antwerp, Belgium. He was particularly alarmed by news of an automatic system that could recognise a licence plate of a car and track it down within 15 minutes. Ingalls decided to find a completely camera-free route through Antwerp and represented on a simple map. He walked his route on June the 21st, 2017, and then produced his map. He traced his route in red felt tip amongst the known sites of security cameras marked with black dots and circles. He called his map the Invisible Route. In 2021, 28,300 people crossed the English Channel in small boats in order to seek asylum in the UK. This was three times the number for 2020. This route into the UK was vanishingly rare until recently. It's a route that involves considerable risk and there have already been deaths. Two solutions to this problem have been offered. One, the solution of the current UK government is to threaten to send anyone who arrives in this manner along a very different route to Rwanda. The argument being that this will reduce incentives to contract with people smuggling gangs who arrange for voyages over the channel. The second is to insist on the availability of safe routes to asylum in the UK. If there were legal means for asylum seekers to enter the UK, then they would not need to risk their lives with flimsy boats. There would be no business for the smuggling gangs that the Rwanda policy is supposed to combat. Routes are relational. Unauthorised routes exist in relation to authorised ones. Before 2018, very few people crossed the 22 miles of English Channel between Calais and Dover in small boats. Refugees and people seeking asylum would more often arrive aboard trains or in trucks on ferries. Routes are more than functional things. While they connect, transform and produce places around them, while they exist in constant relation with other routes used by other people, they are also instrumental in the production of meaning, stories and narratives. Roots and stories are intimately linked in the human imagination. Roots are a metaphor for the passage of time and the passing of life. Our life is a journey. Stories of leaving, travelling and arriving are among the oldest stories we have. For some people the link between route and life story is literal. In 2016 I visited the Museum of Modern Art in New York. There were a series of art pieces on display around the theme of citizens and borders. In her eight channel video installation artwork, The Mapping Journey Project, Moroccan-French artist Bouchra Khalili follows the journeys of eight people who were forced by unlivable conditions at home to move between Africa and Europe. She asks each participant to draw their route onto a map as they tell the story of their journey. The routes are drawn slowly as they talk, with thick black permanent markers. Khalili insists on permanent markers, as in her words, it is as if their drawing were literally erasing the existing and arbitrary boundaries, a singular voice and a singular trajectory. 
The new thick black lines appears against the familiar institutionalised lines of a political map with its established borders and networks of routes. The map, as we know, is a visualisation of forms of spatialised authority. The new lines form a counter map, an alternative rooted geopolitics. The new black lines often double back or circle as the narrator of the journey describes the process of illegal movement, the friction that the line encounters when it meets the older established lines of the map. Each journey and each story, each route, stands by itself as a singular account, but the fact that there are eight journeys happening at once in a single room creates a polyphony of routes that are at once singular and collective, a sinuous interweaving of particular stories and trajectories that interacts with the familiar territories that surround them, both deriving meaning from them and calling them into question. There are no faces in the Mapping Journey project, only hands drawing lines on maps, accompanied by the voice relating the journey. The lack of faces perhaps reflects the link between surveillance and the spatialities of maps with their defined routes and borders. This links the Mapping Journey project back to Martin Ingalls' Invisible Route. In an interview with members of First Nation groups in interior northern British Columbia, geographers Deirdre Wilcock, Gary Brilli and Richard Howitz explored the links between routes and stories in First Nations traditions. The walking routes, which closely mapped onto watercourses in the limestone cast landscape, were far more than ways of getting from A to B. Walking these routes was a journey in space-time, connecting the walkers to their ancestors who also walked those paths. Here's an extract of an interview. Interviewer. So the land defines you both in a time with the ancestors as well as the way in which the land is situated, so where the lakes and the trails are connected? Jim. Yeah, it's part of it. It's not just, you can't just look at it from one perspective. It's like everything's linked together. It's all connected. Every way. Interviewer. Time, space, everything? Jim. Everywhere, yeah, like Larry or Kenny and Victor, other KO holders. It's everything, you know. It's just like he's lost, eh? Like they cut one more block of forest and he's more lost. Every time. Goes spiritually and physically. Not just, you know, it's not just physically, it's not just because it's gone. There's no more trail, there's no more reference points. Spiritually, too. New roots, ruptures in the forest, erase the old ones, creating the time spaces of the settler colonial nation in an ongoing way. Irresponsible passions take us wayward when snowfall blanks the waysides. Ignoring the planners' paths, strollers shortcuts contours into our utopia until angels made by children turn to water. Michel de Sateau famously described roots as spatial stories. They traverse and organise places as they are operationalised through practice. In De Soto, this tends to happen through walking, a practice that enables the tactical use of what is strategically given by the planner, the authorities. De Soto's walker is certainly different from Le Cabusier's walker, who moves in straight lines, determined to get from A to B as efficiently as possible. The first medieval map, De Soto tells us, included only the rectilinear marking out of itineraries, the formative indications chiefly concerning pilgrimages, along with the stops one was to make cities which one was to pass through, spend the night in, pray in, etc. And distances calculated in hours, or in days that is, in terms of the time it would take to cover them on foot. To De Sato, the route of the walker actualised the grammar, the ensemble of possibilities of the city. The crossing, drifting away or improvisation of walking, privilege, transform or abandon spatial elements, he writes. The walker transforms each spatial signifier into something else. And if on the one hand he actualizes only a few of the possibilities fixed by the constructed order, he goes only here and not there. On the other, he increases the number of possibilities, for example, by creating shortcuts and detours and prohibitions. For example, he forbids himself to take paths generally considered accessible or even obligatory. He thus makes a selection. Desire lines are a material reminder of De Soto's drifting walker, an improvised infrastructure produced by repeated practice. To the situationists, the roots of the city mapped out a set of expectations. People, they surmised, were mindlessly rooted as they traversed the city, following the routes that are expected of them. Urban routes channeled people and formed part of the governing structure of everyday life. In order to undo this governing, different routes were needed, routes that had an entirely different logic. 
Conventional routes were detourned, cut up and rearranged in random ways to encourage surprising encounters with the city rather than the ones pedestrians were channeled through. Guy Debord and his collective recognised the power of routes both as diagrams of power and as possibilities for playfully undoing these diagrams. Debord and Jean's 1957 map, The Naked City, is created by the artists using exacto knives to cut out areas of the city they believe to be not yet spoiled by money and authority, and place them into an invigorating vortex of new spatial relations, connected by the suggested roots of red arrows and the, that suggest the possibilities of situationist drifts. The map contrasts with an earlier map drawn in 1952 by Debord's friend Chambert de Leo which traced the movements of a political science student over a year. The map is one of straight lines, mostly between the student's home, school and piano lessons, and the result is a grotesque insect squatting on Paris, designed to show the limitations of our normal and expected routes through the city. Practicing routes by travelling them can become meaningful activities. Driving down Route 66, labelled the Mother Road by John Steinbeck, an extra kind of American identity. The Council of Europe has designated 48 so-called cultural routes, which in their words, demonstrate through means of a journey through space and time how the heritage of different countries and cultures of Europe contributes to a shared and living cultural heritage. These routes include long-standing routes like the pilgrimage route of Santiago de Compostela and the route taken by Sigaric, the Archbishop of Canterbury in 990 AD, when he visited Rome. It's a 3,200 kilometer route designed for walking. Other routes are not so much routes, but collections of linked places, such as the Le Cubiesia route, that takes in Cubiesia-related sites in 21 cities in six countries. The hope of the Council of Europe is that the routes, and the act of travelling the routes, will make clear elements of a common European heritage and draw European citizens closer together. The Migrant Trail is an annual walk in solidarity with people attempting to cross the US-Mexican border. It started in 2004 and continues to this day. It starts in Sasabi, Mexico and ends in Tucson, Arizona, a total of 75 miles. The use of a route as an act of solidarity both mirrors the heterogeneous acts of routing by migrants emptying, attempting to enter the USA and uses the act of practicing a route, of walking, to enact solidarity through the performance of walking. As we approach our destination, I want to reflect on the contours of a critical account of routes and routing. Such an account should recognise the capacities and affordances of routes, their role as means of connection and disconnection, their positions in space and the ways they warp and fold space-time. It should recognise the relationship between routes and the geographers around them, the ways places are brought into being or ruptured and destroyed. We should be alive to the way routes channel mobilities, and we should ask whose interests are being served by this channeling. Similarly, we should pay heed to the material infrastructure that form routes. From the brute physicality of transport routes cutting through cities, to the worn grass that signifies a desire line. These infrastructures often connect points and disconnect points at the same time through the material presence. We should be aware that routes are kinds of places, they carry significance and meaning. Route 66 is John Steinbeck's mother road, Highway 61 is where Bob Dylan tells us that World War III can be very easily done. The Silk Road is a projection of Chinese power from the past into the future. We should ask how the meanings of routes are different from the meanings of other spatial forms and presences, how they create stories through arrangements in time and space. And we should ask how routes are given meaning and enact power through the reiterative practices and mobility they enable or insist upon. From the flow of container ships through the English Channel to the flow of migrants in small boats across it. From acts of pilgrimage on the Camino de Santiago to the acts of solidarity on the migrant trail of the US-Mexico border. All of these, it should be apparent by now, involve the ways power is produced, reinforced and distributed through the creation of striated space in the artery and veins of territories. And we should be aware of the ways the illicit, the marginalised and the downtrodden, the metaphorical vagabonds, both hitch rides on the roots of power and create their own desire lines as diagrams of their own agency in a world that attempts to deny them the promised land of the citizens. Up on the common, where the bracken stick, they crisscross the land, revealing the settled will of sheep. One 
somewhere walked that line first, a maverick in terra incognita, and then the first follower. Small territories claimed, boundaries marked by beating bounds in the night, right there. Sheep heft paths into hills in contoured lines, 